Hi everyone, I'm Helen, a 31-year-old from Jacksonville, Florida. I'm contemplating a change of scenery soon. My journey has been a bit of a roller coaster, particularly enduring a challenging marriage for over a year. Thankfully, with my dad and some help from law enforcement, I managed to navigate my way out. Looking back, I recognize my role in those choices and sometimes wish I had been more discerning. I've always been quite reserved and not much of a social butterfly, preferring the company of my computer and the vast digital universe over real-life interactions. On the rare occasions I did step out, like going to a bar. I'd keep to myself, especially when strangers attempted to befriend me. The thought of being kidnapped by someone I barely knew was enough to keep me at a distance. My mother passed away when I was just five due to a heart condition that went untreated, leaving me in the sole care of my father, a dedicated Marine. His job took him away on long voyages, leaving me to miss him dearly. Despite the distance, he did his best to stay connected with us through letters and calls. The day we lost my mom, he rushed back to comfort me, finding me inconsolable at her funeral. He lifted me into his arms, offering comfort and promising that everything would be okay now that he was back. Clinging to him, I cried myself to sleep that night, lulled by the sound of his voice humming my favorite lullaby. His strength and love have been my guiding light through the darkest times, teaching me resilience and hope. I remember seeing him once, sitting quietly by himself on the sofa with a drink in his hand. He looked so forlorn and pale occasionally whispering to himself before he buried his face into a cushion and wept. It was only the second time I'd ever seen him cry the first being when I had a little accident on a slide and ended up getting hurt. Perhaps he felt guilty about everything that had unfolded in our lives. He decided to take a couple of months off work, and before he left again, he made arrangements for me to stay with my grandmother, who would look after me in his absence. Yes, Dad, I will. I assured him, my heart heavy with his impending departure. He expressed his eagerness to taste the dishes I would learn to make by the time he came back. Then, with a final hug and a promise to take care of myself, he was gone. His work meant he would be away for five months or more, during which he'd send me gifts and souvenirs from his travels. While he was gone, I helped Grandma with the household chores and kept to myself, preferring the solitude of our home over the company of other kids. As I grew older, this preference for solitude deepened, and I found solace in the virtual world, where I could interact with others without the anxiety that real-world interactions brought. The internet became my window to the world, a place where I could explore endless stories and connect with people on a level I found both exhilarating and comforting. I didn't need to face anyone directly. I could share my thoughts, feelings, and interests anonymously, finding friends who understood and accepted me. Through these digital connections, I encountered diverse cultures and perspectives, realizing how much we all have in common despite our apparent differences. The internet bridged the gap between continents, making the world a smaller, more interconnected place. During this virtual exploration, I met Joseph, a streamer. Our friendship began with chats and progressed to video calls. Though we both kept our identities somewhat concealed, I wore a Batman mask and he used a scarf and a beanie to obscure his face. Hi, Helen. It's great to finally see you, he greeted me during two of our calls. Hello, Jose. Nice to meet you, even if it's just virtually, I replied, my voice tinged with nervous excitement. He assured me it was normal to feel nervous, but promised it would get easier with time. Our conversations were a mixture of everyday banter and deeper discussions a testament to the strange yet wonderful friendships formed in the age of the internet. Don't worry, I don't bite. I guess we're both a bit awkward, huh? It's our first real conversation, after all. I started breaking the ice as we delved into our first significant chat. So, Joes, I'm curious. What brought you to this online world? Jose shared his enthusiasm for meeting new people and discovering diverse viewpoints. I'm a bit of a homebody and this digital community felt like the right place to connect with others from the comfort of my own space. How about you? I admitted to my introverted nature, explaining how traditional social settings felt daunting, and how online platforms offered a layer of comfort that made it easier for me to express myself. I find these virtual connections incredibly rewarding. 
It's serendipitous that we met here, I added. Our conversation flowed effortlessly, filled with exchanges of interests and personal anecdotes. I found myself relaxing more with each topic we covered. I never imagined I'd be this at ease talking to someone over the internet. Thanks for making it so seamless, Josie. This means a lot to me. The feeling's mutual, Helen. You're an excellent conversationalist, and I'm glad we connected. If you ever feel like chatting again, just hit me up. I'm usually around playing games. Oh, do you game? Jose asked, his curiosity peaking. I'd like that, I replied. But no, I'm more into blogging and browsing Reddit. It's fascinating what you can discover there. I often find myself learning more from the experiences shared by others than anything else. Exactly. Sometimes our own lives can feel so mundane. There's something special about diving into the lives of others online. I find myself trusting my internet friends more than my real-life ones, Jose confessed. He appreciated the no-strings-attached nature of online friendships, where you're free to engage as much or as little as you prefer. As our conversation unfolded, Jose and I formed a genuine bond, a friendship that felt real despite the digital barrier. Our open-mindedness and mutual understanding highlighted the unique connection you can find in the least expected places. This digital journey of mine has undoubtedly shaped my identity and the way I approach the world. The lessons and experiences from my online haven have become an integral part of who I am. However, my dad, ever cautious, would likely disapprove of these unseen friendships. The last time he visited, he took the opportunity to lecture me on the importance of real-world connections over dinner. How are your studies going, Dove? He had asked, unaware of my recent graduation, a milestone he missed. Our conversation hinted at the gaps in our real-life interactions, underscoring the complexities of my digital and physical worlds colliding. I was swamped with responsibilities and felt bad about it then, just as I do now. I even sent you an email to let you know I'd make it for your birthday tomorrow. Tomorrow's my pumpkin's birthday. Uh, please don't use nicknames. I'm not five anymore, I had to remind him, though he still sees me as his little dove. That's just it, Dad. I don't know how to, but I'll try. I do have friends, but they're online, I admitted. Why bring Mom into this? What are you implying? I snapped, hurt by the direction of our conversation. I'm not implying anything, dear. I'm just saying it's important to find ways to move forward, as much as we both miss her, he gently explained. But I couldn't contain my frustration. I slammed the table, got up without finishing my meal, and stormed off to wash my plate, leaving my dad trying to reach out. Helen, don't take that tone with your father. I'm just trying to help, he said, his voice a mix of concern and disappointment. You don't understand me, so don't try, I retorted, anger boiling over. I retreated to my online world to find Josie, someone who seemed to understand. Jose was kind and a good listener, someone I could vent to about the growing frustration within me. Being an introvert, I've always found solace and comfort at home, in front of my computer screen. While others embraced the world outside, I cherished the safety of my digital haven, a place where I could be myself without the anxiety of real interactions. My father, however, couldn't grasp this. He believed my preference for online life was limiting my personal growth and insisted I experience the world beyond my comfort zone, a thought that filled me with dread. I shared my worries with Joseph, hoping he'd grasp the situation I was in. Hey Helen, would you like to meet in person? We're both introverts so we could pick a quiet place with few people around. I know just the spot, he suggested gently, understanding my need for a comfortable setting. No worries, take all the time you need. I'm here whenever you're ready. Here's my address. You're always welcome, Joseph offered, extending an invitation with patience and kindness. Why are you so nice to me? I'm practically a stranger. I couldn't help but wonder aloud. Because I genuinely like you. It might sound odd coming from me, but I'd love to get to know you better. Whenever you feel the same, you know where to find me, he responded with sincerity making my heart flutter with a mixture of surprise and curiosity. The thought of stepping out into the real world to meet Joseph was daunting. Yet filled with a blend of excitement and anxiety, I found myself outside his home, 
ready to face the unknown. He lived surprisingly close, just a 35-minute drive away. I gathered my courage, took a deep breath, and knocked on the weathered door. It creaked open, and there was Joseph with a welcoming smile that immediately calmed my nerves. He was charming, and his home, though modest, radiated a warmth and genuine character. The cozy interior adorned with beloved books, board games, and his personal workspace spoke volumes about his personality. Welcome to my humble abode, Joseph greeted, his voice filled with an eagerness that made me smile. Your gracious presence brightens my day. I chuckled at his gaming lingo. Thank you. It's quite a cozy place. Do you live here alone? No, my princess. I share the house with my mom. She stays downstairs, while I have the top floor to myself. Let me give you a tour, he offered, leading me through his space. As the day unfolded, we engaged in deep conversations, shared laughter, and discovered even more about one another. Meeting Joseph in person added a new dimension to our relationship, deepening the bond we had formed online. His kindness and authenticity were even more palpable face to face enriching our connection and making me appreciate the person behind the digital persona even more. Josie's unique humor and genuine nature drew me closer to him as we spent more time together. One evening, as the sunset painted the sky with shades of orange and purple, he suggested a walk in the nearby park. I found myself eagerly agreeing, my earlier nerves melting away into comfort and ease. Walking with him felt like a natural continuation of our online conversations now enriched with the immediacy and depth that only face-to-face -face interactions can provide. During our walk, I confided in him about not celebrating my birthday, explaining how a recent argument with my dad left me feeling too unsettled to face any celebration. I'm really sorry to hear that, but I believe he'll understand in time. He's your dad, after all. Jose tried to comfort me. However, as Jose and I grew closer, I began to see another side of him. Despite his sweet words at first, he became possessive and jealous once we started dating. He demanded constant communication, reacting with anger if I spoke to others. His claims of love and protection seemed sincere at first, but I soon questioned why I had so readily believed him. To my dismay, I learned his mother disapproved of our relationship. Knowing she harbored negative feelings towards me, someone she hadn't met, was disheartening. I struggled to understand her stance given the genuine care and love Jose and I shared. His close bond with his mother was clear, and while I respected their relationship, it introduced a wedge between us. Despite Jose's assurances, I felt like an outsider, caught in the shadow of his mother's disapproval. The most confusing aspect was her contradicting attitude towards our future. She seemed to push for our marriage, perhaps seeing me as someone who could cater to her needs, given my lack of family support. This perspective was a stark contrast to the understanding I sought from a potential mother-in-law. Not every parent is perfect. Look at your dad, for instance. At least my mom cares about me, Jose would say, failing to see how his words stung. His remarks about my father not loving me were especially painful. Please, Josie, it hurts when you talk like that. You know how complex my relationship with my dad is? I pleaded, seeking empathy. In this tangled web of emotions and relationships, I found myself questioning the very foundations of our connection. The love and understanding I initially felt from Jose now seemed overshadowed by possessiveness, jealousy, and familial complications. I tried to adapt to stop lamenting my situation and aim to make the best of things. Despite the foreboding sense of unease, I ended up in a clandestine marriage with Joseph. He convinced me that my father would never accept our union, persuading me that my dad's absence was a sign of his lack of love. So, without inviting my dad or anyone else from my side, I married Joseph, stepping into a situation I sensed was fraught with risk. I criticized myself for my lack of strength, attributing my vulnerabilities to the environment I grew up in rather than acknowledging the manipulation I was under. The marriage soon revealed a harsher side of Joseph's mother than I had ever imagined. She embodied cruelty, taking delight in undermining my confidence and joy. Her tactics were insidious at first, snide remarks and demeaning comments that gradually eroded my self-esteem. I held on to the hope that her animosity would diminish over time, 
but it only escalated into relentless emotional abuse. Her criticisms were relentless. This meal is a disgrace. You expect my son to eat this? Start over, she would sneer. Or, this place is filthy. Are you incapable of cleaning properly? And get up and take out the trash. Were you raised with no manners at all? Each word from her was like a blow, designed to belittle me and shake my sense of self-worth. She questioned my decisions, dismissed my accomplishments, and manipulated situations to make me feel unworthy of Joseph's love. Meanwhile, Joseph remained oblivious or indifferent, absorbed in his own world, leaving me to fend for myself in this toxic environment. I felt trapped in a never-ending nightmare, my spirit and resilience wearing thin under the constant barrage of cruelty. The regret of pushing my father away haunted me. His departure after a heated argument right before this entire ordeal left me feeling isolated and full of remorse. I berated myself for my perceived weaknesses, for allowing myself to be drawn into this situation. One day, feeling under the weather and overwhelmed by everything, I sought solace in a nap on the sofa, hoping to find some reprieve in sleep, but any chance of rest was abruptly shattered when a cold splash of water jolted me awake, a harsh reminder of the relentless hostility that had become my daily reality. Waking up in a state of shock and fear, I found myself facing Anne, my mother-in-law, who looked at me with utter disdain. Why are you loafing on the sofa? Did you even bother to do the shopping I asked you to? Her voice dripped with contempt. I remained silent, unable to respond to her accusations. So, you expect me, an old woman, to handle everything while you do nothing? She sneered before striking me across the face and calling for Joseph. I reached my breaking point. I refuse to do anything more for you or your son. I'm done being treated like this. Find someone else to torment, I declared, my patience exhausted. I'd received nothing but disrespect from this family, and I couldn't stand it any longer. As I attempted to leave, a blunt object struck me from behind and darkness engulfed me. When consciousness returned, I found myself in a dimly lit semi-dark room, pain throbbing through my head. Struggling to stand, I stumbled, overwhelmed by pain and confusion about my whereabouts. Faint, distorted sounds grew clearer as they neared. Desperately, I crawled toward a metal door with a small window, using it to pull myself up. The door suddenly swung open, revealing Joseph with a mocking smile. Scared of the dark, are we? He taunted. I pleaded with him to let me out, promising to change, to no longer voice any complaints. But his response was cold and merciless. This is your punishment for disrespecting my mother. You'll stay here, cut off from the world. After all, who's going to miss you? Your mother's gone and your father doesn't care about you. You had a chance to start anew here, but you've squandered it, he sneered. There, in the cold, dark basement, a mixture of fear and rage coursed through me. How had my life spiraled into this nightmare? All I had done was stand up against unjust demands, and now I was trapped, punished for seeking respect and dignity. In the depths of my despair, feeling the consequences of asserting myself, I discovered my phone in my pocket. It was damaged. Its screen barely alive, yet a glimmer of hope sparked within me. Amidst the darkness, the faint light of the screen blinked back at me. With my father's number etched in my memory, I dialed it, my hands shaking and tears blurring my vision. I recounted my ordeal through a trembling voice, clinging to the slim chance that he could rescue me from this terror. Three days later, as despair nearly claimed me, the sound of a car outside signaled a sliver of hope. My heart raced as I listened for the footsteps approaching. The door finally opened to reveal my father, a pillar of strength and resolve. The sight of him flooded me with a mix of relief and disbelief. He had come to my rescue, bringing police officers with him. Jose and Anne were quickly apprehended, their feeble attempts to deny their actions falling flat. You have no idea what's waiting for you in court, my dad declared with rightful anger. Despite their protests and excuses, their fate was sealed. As my dad led me out of that dark, confining space, I felt a surge of courage and resolve. The harrowing experience, though far from easy, had revealed an inner strength I didn't know I possessed. 
With my father's steadfast support, I emerged ready to face any challenge that lay ahead. I resolved then to always stand up for myself, to never again let anyone silence my voice. The hope for justice burned within me, a wish to see Jose and his mother face the consequences of their actions. I decided to start anew, leaving Jacksonville for Augusta, Georgia with my dad, seeking safety and a fresh start away from the memories that haunted me. This ordeal also taught me a valuable lesson about the dangers of trusting strangers online. A lesson I'll carry with me always. I work at a big company, and I can earn enough for both of us, so don't worry, Eric said during our engagement. But as soon as we got married, he changed. He and Larry started insulting me every day. On top of that, Eric took control of all the money and cut down on living expenses. He constantly complained, even though I did all the cooking. Fed up, I told Eric I wanted a divorce and left the house. Later, I bumped into Larry by chance. Hey, I heard you're getting a divorce now, he said. I was surprised and replied, you must be mistaking me for someone else. Larry smirked and said, don't pretend. We're not together anymore, so don't come to me about money. I won't lend you a cent, remember that. Before I could respond, he disappeared into the crowd. I lowered my head, feeling the stares of people passing by, and started to laugh. Poor guy, he knows nothing. I can't wait to see his reaction when he finds out the truth. I'm Michelle, a 53-year-old housewife. I married Eric seven years ago. When we met, Eric seemed like a great guy. We met at a gathering of friends, and I found him fun and friendly. As we said goodbye, he asked if we could meet just the two of us next time. Feeling a bit sad about parting, I agreed. When we started dating, he mentioned he had a son named Larry from his previous marriage. Larry was in fifth grade then, and we had dinner together a few times. He was a bright and pleasant boy, just like his dad. A year later, on the night Eric proposed, I decided to open up. You know I live with my parents and work part-time, right? The company I joined right after graduation was really tough and it ruined my health, I said. Is that so? It must have been hard to quit, Eric replied. I think long hours will be difficult for me in the future, I added. Eric smiled kindly and said, don't worry about it. Just stay at home. I work at a big company, and I can earn enough for both of us. Relieved by his words, I accepted his proposal. I was happy to have met a good man and thought we were starting a happy married life. I never imagined I would feel so hopeless in less than half a year. As we got used to living as a family of three, Eric and Larry's attitudes changed a lot. They started making fun of everything I did and said, Mom, are you in bed again? Where's my sandwich? Larry asked with a frown as he came into the bedroom before school. I had been helping with weeding at a nearby park yesterday and felt sick because it was an unusually hot day. I had already been feeling unwell since the day before. I had asked Eric for help, but he refused with an annoyed look and said, Being a housewife must be nice, just slacking off all year. I need my days off too, you know. Let me rest. The next morning, I couldn't get up because I had pushed myself too hard. I apologized to Larry and said, Sorry, Larry. I couldn't make your sandwich. Here's some money to buy one at the grocery store. Larry complained, Mom, can't you at least make a sandwich? You always take shortcuts with frozen food or leftovers. You're failing as a mom if you can't even cook. His words hurt. Don't blame Mom, Larry. Eric said with a half-smile as he passed by in the hallway. Since you skipped the sandwich, tonight's dinner must be fancy. Oh, is that so? Then I'll look forward to it. Being a housewife, you should have plenty of time for dinner, right? You're not sleeping all day, are you? Make sure to clean thoroughly without slacking. The two of them laughed at my poor condition and made their insensitive comments before leaving. As if I could prepare a fancy meal lying in bed, Staring at the ceiling, I let out a heavy sigh. Eric is extremely stingy despite being a section chief at a big company and earning a high salary. 
The money he gave me for living expenses was ridiculously low. It's my salary, so why should my wife manage it? Eric insisted on managing the finances himself after we got married, and I meekly agreed. I thought it didn't matter who handled the money as long as it was done properly. But then Eric started spending money as he pleased. It's necessary for work. Drinking expenses are business expenses. It's essential, he would say as an excuse to buy expensive clothes and watches for himself. But he would make a sour face even if I needed something small. When I bought cheap snacks, Eric would get angry because he believed a housewife doesn't need any spending money. I had to ask for his permission every time I wanted to spend money, whether it was for a haircut or buying clothes. One pair of jeans is enough, isn't it? You're buying more, he would ask. I replied, I want a warm pair for winter. He said, fine, but get them from a cheap store. I would also wanted to go to the hair salon regularly. Can I go once every three months to keep my hairstyle? I asked. Eric scoffed. Why do you need to be fashionable? If you keep your hair long, you only need to cut it once every seven months. No more haircuts. Because of this, I was only allowed to buy cheap makeup from drugstores. I wanted to use better products because the cheap ones were harsh on my skin. But Eric didn't care. The money Eric gave for living expenses was very low about one-third of what most people spend. With this small budget, it was hard to maintain a balanced diet. When I complained, Eric responded smugly. On the TV show about saving money, they lived on this amount. They had a farmer relative who gave them vegetables and bread. I told him, that's not possible with these high prices. He replied, that's your job to manage. What really hurt me was how Eric acted when it came to sending a wreath for my dad's funeral. When dad, who had been sick, passed away, and it was time to send a wreath, Eric frowned and said, We don't need to send a wreath for the funeral, right? Only the main mourner needs to send one. He suggested, Use your savings, it's not my problem. As I prepared for the funeral with tears in my eyes, his lack of care made me angry. I said, I never planned to ask you for it, so don't worry. He replied, good, but do Larry and I really have to go? It'll ruin our long weekend. Right, Dad? Larry added, I wanted to play a new game. Although they complained, I didn't doubt they would come. However, Eric and Larry arrived late to the funeral, barely greeted my mom and relatives, and left quickly. My mom, who was very tired, didn't have the energy to get upset but my relatives were furious. What's going on, Eric? Your wife's father died, and you're acting so cold. Larry, you've received so many gifts and allowances from Michelle's dad, they said. While I apologized to my relatives, I felt my love for Eric and Larry quickly fading. Eric, always in his stylish suits with a charming presence, and Larry, attending a prestigious university and seen as a handsome father and son by the neighbors only insulted me at home. They wouldn't come straight home after work or school, instead wandering around and coming back with the smell of lipstick and perfume. Despite doing whatever they wanted, they treated me like a maid, demanding fancy meals with the little money I had for food. When I served dishes with chicken or pork, both Eric and Larry would glare at me with disdain and insult me. Don't you want to serve your husband good food after he comes home from work? If I get sick from eating this bad food, how will you take responsibility? Are you even a mom, they would say. I could make delicious meals, even with chicken or pork. They disliked vegetables and fish, but eating such a picky diet will make you sick. Eric would reply, I'd eat if it were high quality. Don't complain when you can't satisfy us. I don't need advice from someone as weak as you. They used to eat while complaining, but lately they just left the food untouched. Yet, if I didn't cook, they would yell, Are you slacking off even though you're a wife? I would eat the leftovers for breakfast or lunch the next day, but tears would well up as I wondered for whom I was cooking. For their meals, they relied on store-bought sandwiches, instant noodles, and snacks. Eventually, Eric was diagnosed with prediabetes during a company health check, and Larry started gaining weight. It was inevitable. 
Then they lashed out at me, saying, What kind of wife makes her husband and child sick? We don't need a useless person like you. We're getting a divorce. Then I'll leave, I said. They were surprised when I agreed easily. Are you sure? You're unemployed. You've been living off me. How will you survive now? Eric asked. Don't worry about me. I'll send the divorce papers for you to sign later. Please leave my stuff until the movers come to pick it up, I replied. Nobody's going to take your stuff, Eric sneered. You'll definitely regret divorcing a high-earning, handsome guy like me. A kind husband who lets you be a housewife with three meals and naps. There's no one else like that in the world, right? That's right. You've been living in luxury on dad's money till now. You'll struggle from here on, Larry added. As I packed my clothes into a suitcase, Eric and Larry kept talking behind me. Honestly, I envied Eric's ability to overestimate himself so much. When we were dating, I saw this part of him as confident and shining. You'll just go back to your parents, right? Say hi to your retired mom for me. You two will be heading straight to poverty, Eric said. Larry laughed at his father's prediction. They'll end up on welfare soon. They already reek of poverty, but with grandma, it'll be the ultimate. The funeral the other day was nothing special. It smelled like poverty. I thought so too, like a poor family's funeral. I want a fancy one, Larry agreed. But for Dad, who works at a big company, and me, attending a prestigious university, poverty is a different world. Their endless comments made me really angry, but I knew it was pointless to argue, so I just let it go. After I went back home and explained everything to Mom, she said in a low voice, at the funeral, seeing Eric and Larry, I felt something was wrong. But I thought it's not good to interfere too much in my daughter's household so I kept quiet. I was too busy taking care of Dad. I'm sorry for barging in like this. I replied, it's okay, I've been lonely without you. Why don't you stay here? Thanks, but once I get my job on track, I plan to move to an apartment, I said. Mom's concern was comforting, but I knew living with her might make me too dependent. Living nearby and visiting sometimes seemed like the right balance. Yes, Eric and Larry mocked me for being unemployed, but actually, I had been working from home. It all started with the budget recipes I posted on my blog. After getting many positive comments, I bravely launched a cooking site and shared my recipes, which quickly gained readers and internet fame. Soon after, an editor from a major publisher approached me, and now I'm getting ready to publish a cookbook. Because of this, I didn't have time to think much about the divorce, and the days flew by. One day, my phone rang insistently. I stopped stirring the ingredients in the pan and answered. Hello, I said. Hey, what's this about a clause for the divorce trial? Eric asked. I sighed, knowing it was about that. You and Larry insulted me all the time, I said. Oh, I thought, never mind, Eric said with relief in his voice. I didn't cheat or anything you know. Hmm, did you record me and Larry? Your memory alone won't work. I replied, I've noted everything in my diary. Try to claim otherwise if you can. Eric scoffed, really, poor people and their obsession with money. You're so stingy. If you think you can get a deposit for the divorce trial, go ahead. After his outburst, Eric hung up. I finished cooking and then visited a detective agency to investigate Eric's background. Soon, his affair with a co-worker was uncovered. The day after I sent photos of the two of them together and the investigation report to his company, Eric contacted me again. You spreading this at work is low. The angry manager reported it to the higher-ups, and now I'm in trouble, he said. I'm fired. Oh, she was the manager's daughter, wasn't she? It's your fault for cheating, knowing they're strict about such things, I said, laughing. But you should be fine, right? With all the saving you did, you must have plenty of money. Aren't you and Larry living comfortably? Larry moved into a dorm this spring because commuting was tough. I prepaid dorm fees and have apartment loans. My savings were drained by that woman. She was two-timing me with a younger guy, Eric replied. 
Sounds tough for you, but it's none of my concern. Oh, and about the divorce trial deposit, I'll also take half the value of the apartment for property distribution. When the invoice arrives, please transfer the full amount to my account, I said. Eric was yelling on the other end, but I hung up without caring. One day, while returning from shopping in town, I bumped into Larry. He was dressed in his usual flashy clothes, with piercings all over his face and an eye-catching hairstyle, making him easy to spot from a distance. Seeing me, Larry raised his hand in greeting. Hey, heard you're getting government assistance now. I looked puzzled. Huh? Who are you mistaking me for? Don't pretend, Larry said, smirking. It's obvious where an unemployed old lady like you would end up. If you had just followed me and dad, you'd still be living a comfortable life. It's pathetic. Feeling really angry, I couldn't help but reply, Getting government help is a citizen's right. Any one of us could need it someday due to illness or an accident. It's wrong to look down on that. Yeah, yeah, so you're saying you're getting it too, Larry said, smirking and pointing his finger at me. Listen, you and I are estranged. Don't come crying to me for money. Remember that. As I opened my mouth to reply, he turned his back and disappeared into the crowd. I lowered my head conscious of the stares of passersby, shaking my shoulders. I couldn't help but laugh, it was just too ridiculous. Poor thing, he knows nothing. I can't wait to see his reaction when he finds out the truth. A few days later, I woke up to find an unbelievable number of missed calls from Larry. Reluctantly, I called back. Larry shouted furiously, You deceived me, old woman. What are you talking about? I've heard from a cousin you got three high-rise apartments from grandpa's inheritance and are living a carefree life. Hiding that and getting a divorce is cowardly, he said. That's my personal asset. Why should I share it? I have to tell you or Eric, it's joint property. You should have done a distribution of property with dad during the divorce. Unfortunately, it became mine after the divorce procedures, so I can't give it to Eric. Officially, I knew from Dad's will that it would be mine, but I delayed the process until after the divorce because I didn't want to share it with Eric. Larry shouted in frustration, A rich woman like you getting government help? I'll report you to the authorities right now. Feel free, I replied. It's not me, but Eric, who is receiving it. Larry fell silent. What I told you last time, it's not me, I explained as if talking to a child. Honestly, even without the inheritance, I can live well. I have income from my cooking website and book sales, which I started secretly. But Eric, after spending all his money on his affair, has lots of bills piling up and is borrowing heavily. When his affair was discovered and he was fired, his income stopped. Are you listening? Dad's on government assistance now, I said, pulling the phone away from my ear as Larry screamed. Waiting for him to calm down. I continued, you really didn't know anything. He's too proud to tell his son. According to relatives, he asked for money. He's behind on his apartment rent and facing eviction, staying at home all day in an old apartment. If you're worried, why don't you contact him? There was silence on the other end for a while. Then Larry said resentfully, you're cold-hearted. After all Dad did for you, you have no intention of repaying him. If you have money, you should give some to dad. Why should I? I said. Since our marriage, it's been nothing but unpleasant memories. I don't feel like I owe him anything, I stated coldly. If you're so concerned, why don't you, his son, lend him money? You're working part-time after all. I don't have savings. The part-time pay goes to hanging out with friends and stuff, Larry said, suddenly evasive. I smirked. You've been living quite lavishly for a student. Borrowing money to hang out at clubs is not a good idea. How do you know that? He asked. The other day in town, I saw you from across the street. After we parted, you met up with a girl at a club and went into a brand store arm in arm. Also, a club membership card was left at the house. Using my credit card for shopping without my permission is out of the question. Larry stammered, that's unfair. You got high-rise apartments from Grandpa. 
Why don't I or dad get a share? This is discrimination. Yeah, yeah, the credit card bill will be sent soon. Make sure you pay it before it's due, I replied. Before I could finish, the call was disconnected. I sighed and ended the call too. Just when I thought it was all over, a few months later, Eric and Larry showed up at my parents' house without any notice. The doorbell rang nonstop, and when I answered there they were, expecting they came to ask for money, I let them in to avoid causing a scene in the neighborhood. Eric and Larry, who used to look so stylish, now appeared completely different, wearing wrinkled shirts and dirty pants, with lifeless and gaunt eyes. Yet, they still had the energy to be sarcastic. As they walked into the living room, Eric looked around and sneered, Same old house, huh? Why not sell one of those high-rise apartments and rebuild this place? Do something nice for mom, living miserably on her pension. This is dad's house, and we like it this way. More importantly, when are you two planning to pay me back? You're past the deadline, I said. Eric, lifting his chin arrogantly, replied, Michelle, I'll forgive you now, so let's remarry. You started a cooking site, right? If you manage the household perfectly, I'll even let you work, so come back. Such a generous dad, forgiving the wife who abandoned her husband and child. So mom, why not live with dad again? Living with just two women must be insecure. Stunned, I was speechless. After a moment, intense anger welled up inside me. Don't joke with me. How much more do you plan to ridicule and fool me? I shouted at the astonished Eric and Larry. After treating me like nothing more than a housekeeper, insulting me, not providing proper living expenses, and then kicking me out, now you want me back just because you found out I inherited high-rise apartments. No way. What? You're going to abandon us? Rich people really are stingy. Knowing we're struggling with money and still demanding payment, you're heartless. You were poor yourself until recently. Don't get cocky, Eric retorted. In the middle of the argument, Mom returned from shopping. Eric and Larry immediately started buttering her up. Please lend us some money. We'll probably pay it back. Besides, isn't it unfair that only Michelle gets Grandpa's inheritance? Give me one of the high-rise apartments, too. Hi, Grandma. Long time no see. How have you been? Grandma, please persuade Mom to remarry Dad. He doesn't want to break up, but Mom is being stubborn. Mom, surprised at first, changed her expression upon hearing their words. She placed her shopping bag on the floor and let out a deep sigh. So shameless, both of you, she said. What? Eric and Larry responded, confused. I'm telling you to have some shame, Mom shouted suddenly. Startled by her loud voice, Eric and Larry were understandably confused. Mom usually never scolded them sharply. I've heard everything about the divorce from Michelle. I can't believe you have the nerve to show up here, Mom said firmly. No, no, Michelle's exaggerating. You have to listen to our side too, Eric said quickly. That's right, Grandma. Mom is quite the liar, Larry added. I remember how well you two behaved at my husband's funeral. Mom cut off Larry's words sternly. Arriving late, not greeting me or the relatives yawning through the service, and leaving before the coffin was sent off. And now you dare ask for his inheritance? Go back to sleep. She drove a taken-aback Eric and Larry to the front door and glared at them one last time. You two are now strangers to us. Don't come here again. If you do, I'll call the police. Mom threw their shoes out the door, forcing them to leave in their socks, and immediately locked the front door. Eric, who had been avoiding paying me, was advised by his lawyer that a lawsuit would cost even more. Reluctantly, he finally transferred the money to my account. Even though Eric was fired from his job, he couldn't find another one. His in-laws, hearing about his situation from relatives, stepped in to cover his debts. They visited my parents' house and apologized profusely for Eric's behavior. Later, Eric, having given up on finding a new job, returned to the countryside pretending he was helping with the family's farming. However, the story of our divorce spread through the village, leading both children and elders to point and laugh at him.
There's thrifty Uncle Eric, even with a degree from a good university and a job at a big company. What's the use if your wife leaves you for being too arrogant? They would say. The reason for his divorce from his first wife was also his reckless spending. He'll never change. Being mocked by the villagers was embarrassing. Eric kept sending me persistent messages asking to remarry to save face, so I deleted his contact. His mistress, apparently no longer interested after the money ran out, had long since left him. I found her with the detective's help and made sure she paid the divorce trial's security deposit. I also made Larry pay back the money he used on the credit card without permission. Even though he was enrolled in a prestigious university and was on track to become successful like his father, Larry started skipping classes and fooling around. This led to failing grades and eventually getting expelled. His friends and girlfriends were worried, but Larry, in his arrogance, pushed them away with his prideful comments. He then had a big fight with Eric saying, you're my father, but you won't help pay off the debt. Now, they don't talk to each other. Larry lives alone in a small apartment, getting by with part-time jobs. Gone are the days of buying whatever he wanted and making sarcastic remarks despite his high earnings. For me, it's a refreshing change. My cooking website is doing well, and I signed a book deal. I moved to the top floor of the high-rise apartment I inherited from Dad. Mom is still healthy at 75, and the high-rise is close to our family home, so it's convenient if she needs anything. I'm planning a surprise hot spring trip for Mom's upcoming birthday. Though my marriage didn't work out, I want to keep having a good relationship with Mom.